Hello, children, and welcome to our final Exorcist Club. That's right, Exorcist Club session four. I appreciate everybody who's come in to Twitch to watch these live and everyone who is tithed to the church with all of these wonderful gift subs, particularly Uncle Marcus, Davey Sockrocker, and Mr. Working Class. You guys have been so generous. Thank you so much. Uh, before we get into it, Though, uh, you know, since we're talking about demons, I think we should start off with a little bit of the Lord's Prayer. We're going to do a little prayer time. So if everyone out there, if you can close your eyes and, and bow your heads, I'll, I'll pray it up for you so we can dispel any demonic energy that may be lurking. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory, now and forever. Amen. Amen, guys. Amen. I highly recommend you guys, if you don't know the Lord's Prayer, you know, act, fucking memorize that shit. It can help you in a pinch if you're ever confronted with some with some serious uh, demonic energy it can help you dispel some some evil energies out there so all right guys amen amen everyone amen amen let me see those, i got some i got like a beans beans fur I was giving her some kisses earlier and some fucking on my face here it's a little tickly all right well let's uh you know let's get into book four chapter one let my cry come unto thee uh, and we start off with, he who abides in love abides in God and God in him by St. John. And what this means is, um, you know, love for God and others is the way to remain growing in the Lord. All right. So those who do so have God abiding or living in them. Great godly love is a powerful sign that a person is a genuine believer in Christ. So uh, we've got a, we've got a priest, Karis, who has lost his faith. He has been looking for his faith, and I think that this demon is here to help him. Here to help Karis rediscover his faith, uh, get it back together, so that he can abide in love and abide in God yet again. So in our chapter one, uh, we have. Kinderman is putting the picture together, all right? He's starting to figure it out. He's like, he's like, okay, so there's the Dennings murder and then there's the desecrations. Uh, these two things are linked by a witchcraft situation going on. We've got Damien Karras, who is an expert on witchcraft. He's been seen going to the McNeil's house, you know. We've got a typewritten blasphemous altar card that has a small fingerprints on it, possibly the fingerprints of a child. This typewritten card also uh, matches a uh, the typewriter at the McNeil home. You know, each typewriter, the way it types is is individual, and so you can kind of compare these two things and see see if they're similar, and they are. Um, but it wasn't written by Sharon because he he stole a note on the typewriter that was written by Sharon. And it wasn't her. So whoever typed it wasn't Sharon, but it was on that typewriter. Uh, if Burke's death was a murder, it was done by somebody of extraordinary strength. Carl Engstrom, the only man in the house uh, who would be potentially strong enough to do this, uh, he's not a suspect. He has an alibi. He was going to see his junkie daughter. Uh... Now, mental disorders at times can cause extraordinary strength. And Reagan McNeil seems to be having some um, mental disorder problems. And so this haunted logic has led Kinderman to believe that... Oh, I'm going to sneeze. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Excuse me, everybody. Bless me. Bless bless me, everyone. I, I need to see some blesses in the chat. All right. Oh my God, I sneezed. All right. Uh, so he believes that, I mean, the only person that it could be is Reagan. But he obviously does not want 
to arrest a child. <laughs> it's just like, this is not a good situation. This is not a great situation. Uh, he is staking out the McNeil house. He sees a tall old man getting out of a cab, going into the house. Time is running out for Reagan. Okay. She has been put through so much physically by this possession. You know, the demon won't allow her to eat and she's not sleeping and she's having these fits. And I mean, she's uh, looks terrible. The whole thing, you know, like it's very physically exhausting. And so she's kind of nearing the verge of death through exhaustion. You know, there's a, a threat of her going into a coma. She has to constantly be sedated by enormous amounts of librium. Karis is exhausted. You know, he's uh and he's thinking about Marin getting called in for the exorcism. He's a little butthurt by it. He's like, why can't I fucking do it? You know, it's like, because you have little faith and that's the whole thing. Like Jesus said, like to his followers, like, why can't we, why can't we throw out demons? And I'm like, well, your faith isn't strong enough. And that kind of stung him. But Karis is shocked that Marin, Lancaster Marin is coming in because uh, this man uh, is a, he has so much extreme intellectual and philosophical respect for Marin based on his books, interpreting his faith in terms of matter that was still evolving and destined to be spirit at the end of time and would join with Christ at the Omega point. I, I was like, can we talk more about this, please? Like this, this, this one theory of Lancaster Marin's about about matter in the universe we live in a material physical realm that matter is uh destined to be spirit we're growing upwards into the spiritual realms and at the end of time uh we will join with christ as what he calls the omega point so we will you know the universe will become and you know in the kabbalah christ is identified with the tifereth uh, level of the Kabbalah. So you have like Malkuth and then you have Yesod and you have like Tifereth up here. So, you know, it's like, that's interesting to me. It's like, oh, so would we hit the, the Tifereth dimension? Is that, is that where he's thinking, you know, that we would be, is, would, is that what the Omega point is, you know? Cause really, I mean, above Tifereth, way high up is Kether. And that's like, that's like, you're, you, you are God. God is one. God is everything. That's all the energy is right there. But there is no, it, that's like in, you know, in Evangelion where everybody turns into like, uh, the end of Evangelion where everybody turns into, um, that orange goo. That's kind of, kind of similar to Kether. I feel like, what, what is that called in Evangelion where, where everybody turns into the orange goo? And it's like, not the LCL. No, 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 not the LCL. There's like a, there's like a term that they use when it's like, oh, this is the, I can't fucking remember. Anyways, I can't fucking remember. Oh, Uncle Marcus, thank you for the gift sub. Um, anyways, uh, maybe I'll think of it later. But anyways, okay, so whatever, let's move on. Let's move on. I, I do want to know more about the Omega point, though. I would love, I wish Blatty would elaborate more on this. Um... So Chris McNeil has been reading one of Marin's books. She knows that he's on the way. And so she ordered some of his books and uh, she reads this uh, passage from one of his books to Karis. And she's saying uh, that it is, uh, you know, she says it's a very beautiful. And this, this excerpt is really from a sermon from Cardinal John Henry Newman titled The Second Spring. Um, so, and in it, uh, what they say is we have familiar experience of the order of the constancy, the perpetual renovation of the material world, which surrounds us frail and a transitory as is every part of it, restless and migratory as are its elements. Still it abides. It is bound together by a law of permanence. And though it is ever dying, it is ever coming back to life again. Disillusion does but give birth to fresh modes of organization, and one death is the parent of a thousand lives. Each hour as it comes is but a testimony how fleeting, yet how secure, how certain is the great whole. It is like an image on the waters, which is ever the same, though the waters ever flow. The sun sinks to rise again, the day is swallowed up in the gloom of night to be born out of it, as fresh as, it, as, as if it had never been quenched. 
Spring passes into summer and through summer and autumn into winter, only the more surely by its own ultimate return to triumph over that grave towards which it resolutely hastened from its first hour. We mourn the blossoms of May because they are to wither, but we know that May is one day to have its revenge upon November. But the revolution of that solemn circle, which never, st or by the revolution of that solemn circle, which never stops, which teaches us in our height of hope to be ever to be sober and in our depths of desolation, never to despair. Uh, I really, I like that a lot. Talking about how everything's cyclical, you know, you have your, you have your up times, you have your down times, you know, something falls apart that, that creates all these opportunities for new growth. Uh, new growth creates new opportunities for death. <laughs> it's just, it's a cycle. It goes on and on and on. And that's the whole deal. I liked at the end where it says, uh, you know, at the, uh, at the height of our hope ever to be sober. You know, so when you're really pumped, you're like, wow, everything's going so great. You got to know that this gravy train is going to end, you know, like nothing goes on forever. Like nothing is going to be this great for forever. And also, but also the other side of that is in the depth of our desolation, never to despair. You know, you know that even at your lowest point, it can't stay there either. You know, like things are always going to change. Um, you know, things are ever changing. And I, I like that. I thought that was really great. I'm glad that he snuck that into this book, you know, tricked all these people into reading this scary book. And then he's putting all these sermons in here. I like that. I like that. <sighs> oh, my God. My elbows are so fucking tight. Uh, anyways. OK, so uh, the demon's been raging upstairs. It stops. goes quiet. Then the doorbell rings. Marin shows up. He's fucking early. He's fucking early. Uh, immediately he comes inside. He's like, I want to see, I want to see Reagan. I need to go up there right now. He walks up there. The demon calls out before he gets up there, though. The demon starts calling his name, Marin. And then this, these blows start shaking the wall. Marin. Oh, he knows. He knows Lancaster's fucking showed up. He goes up there. They meet. There's silence, then laughter. Marin exits and then talks to Karis. Uh... He's like, Damien, I need you to go. I need you to get a cassock. I need you to get two surpluses. I need a purple stole. I need holy water. I need two copies of the Roman ritual. The big version. Okay, the large one. We're going to need the large version of the fucking Roman ritual. And uh, let's just get started. Let's, let's get started right now. Let's quit fucking around, guys. All right, we don't have time. Nobody has time. Reagan doesn't have time. Let's just fucking, let's go for it. And everyone's like, oh, oh, uh, okay. You want oh, to do this now? Oh, fuck. Um... Uh, and Karis is just like, don't you want to hear the background of this case? Like, do you want me to tell you, like, any, you know? And he's like, why? And uh, I was like, no, why? There's a demon upstairs. I don't, I don't need your bullshit. Like, I, he just, like, cuts through, cuts through the, the overcomplicated psychological nonsense immediately. And is like, no, I don't need to know a fucking thing. I know that there's a fucking demon upstairs. And that's all I need to know, bitch. So just go get the holy water. I need you to shut the fuck up. And uh, let's let's get to it. And uh, Karis is like, okay, you're right. He uh, While Karis is gone, uh, Marin and Chris have a, a coffee and brandy before before he goes upstairs. They have some small talk about names. He asks if uh, Chris McNeil is her real name. Because he also, I believe, I believe this question is really because he's trying to make sure that Reagan's name is, like, her real name or something. Maybe not, but I felt like, you know, you want to use the right name. And if it's, like, her her mom has a weird name, I don't know. I was thinking maybe that's it. Maybe it's just small talk. I don't know. But he, she's like, no, that's my that's my name. That's not a stage name. And uh, she asks about Lancaster. She's like, what is, what is that? You know, like, what, what the fuck? Is, what kind of name is that? That's a cool name. And he's like, he thinks that it's a, the name of a bridge possibly which i thought was really interesting because lancaster is kind of a bridge you know he, he acts as a bridge uh to help get this fucking demon out of this girl and then he comments on damien's name saying that he loved the name um and that damien is also the name of a priest who devoted his life to taking care of lepers on the island of molokai until he finally caught the disease himself <laughs> a little foreshadowing for you. A little foreshadowing. You know, you got Karis. He's been administering to this fucking, this fucking leper, you know, like, oh my goodness. 
Uh, also, though, Damien means powerful man of the people and to tame. So Damien also means to tame, which, I mean, that's kind of what he's just trying to tame these demons, you know, trying to get these demons out. Chris feels safe for the first time in a really long time. She's like, oh, finally, somebody knows what the fuck. You know, like, finally, some competent motherfucker who gets it. Like, oh, my God, I'm so happy. Uh, Marin, he's take, he's popping nitroglycerin. This man's got a heart condition. Uh, he's doing it on the sly. I don't want anyone to know, but he's, like, not in great shape. He's an old guy. His heart's a little, his, his ticker is a little, little dicey there. Uh, Sharon goes, or Chris goes to talk to Sharon, who witnessed Marin with Reagan upstairs when he first came up, and she said that the two just stared at each other, uh, and then the demon said, this time you're gonna lose, and then Marin exited, so that was their first meeting. Uh, Sharon and Chris feel this growing tension in the house, this gradual pulsing and thickening of the air. Karis comes in with the supplies, and he also feels this thickening stillness crushing down on him, choking him of breath and his sense of a world that was solid and real. So it is finally go time. All right, it's go time. The air is thickening up. It's electric. You can feel it. You can feel it. Uh, and so, uh, you know, before they go in, Marin is telling Karis, avoid conversation with the demon, okay? Just like, just don't, don't talk to the demon. And Karis, again, is, like, taken aback because he just so casually calls it a demon. Like, he believes that this is a demon upstairs. And it's like he has so much intellectual respect for this man. He thinks that Marin is such a, a brilliant mind. And yet Marin 100% believes that this is a demon, you know, is, like, a hunt all in on it. And it's like, well, fuck. Like, if this man, who I believe is uh an intellectual giant if he believes in this like that really kind of shakes him and it's just like wow like this might be really a thing then you know like and he gets he inches one step closer towards rediscovering his faith uh and it's also interesting too because that's all karis has been doing with this demon is conversing with this demon you know and Mara's just like don't do that that's a fucking bad idea that's a fucking bad idea uh, but he's like, do not listen to this thing, okay? It's going to mix truths with lies. You just don't listen. It's a psychological attack. It's coming for you, pal. So just, like, just shut the fuck up. Just don't fucking talk to this bitch. Uh, and then, you know, Karis is like, well, there's there's been three personalities manifested. And he's like, nope, nope, nope. There's only one. All right, I want to hear your shit. There's one demon. That's it. Okay? Like, just zip it. I know what I'm talking about. And they go into the icy, cold, terrible smelling room. God, this demon just makes the worst smells. They're just pumping smells out of this little body. Just the worst smells it can come up with. You know, it's like, what a bummer. Uh, we start with a little holy water, you know, a little, little holy water. Uh, we move on to some Our Father action. You know, they, they did the Lord's Prayer. Then uh, they start the Roman ritual. Bed starts rising off the floor in front of everybody. Sharon. Carl, Karis, they're all like, whoa, like, what the fuck? Like, it's, it's not just, like, jumping. It's, like, levitating in the air, you know, the whole fucking bed. So that's also uh, one step closer. I wish they described the odor more. Yeah, me, no, me, no. I was like, ugh, God. Every time they were talking about it, I was just like, this is the worst. Um... So, yeah, they're all like, uh, what the fuck, you know? And Sharon, like, goes to get Chris. She's like, Chris, you got to see this shit. <laughs> like, this crazy dog. Uh, Marin is totally unfazed. He continues, I, I don't give a fuck. Float the bed all you want, bitch. I don't give a shit. Traces the cross on uh, her forehead. He pushes the purple stole to Reagan's neck while praying. Reagan begins pumping out green putrid vomit onto Marin's hand. Unbothered, he just keeps going. He doesn't give a fuck. He's like, go ahead, puke on my hand, girl. I don't care. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to get this demon out. Puke on me all you want, bitch. And it it's just it just keeps it just keeps coming out. It just keeps fucking coming out until his entire hand is like just buried in a steaming mound of putrid green vomit. You know, just oh, so fucking gross. Uh Karis checks her pulse. Uh, the shit's unbelievable. You know, I mean, it's just it's crazy. Like he's so worried about her fucking heart. 
and Marin continues. There's this deafening and fast pounding that begins in the room, you know, and I mean, even Sharon's like having to close her ears because it's just, it's too much. It's so loud and it becomes so fast. Um, the demon mocks Marin. He calls him out for his sin of pride. Because, uh, you know, we all have our we all have our deadly sins. Some of us engage in, in certain ones more than others. Marin's is pride. I liked how he told him that uh, his abode is in a nest of peacocks. The place is, or your place is within yourself. Go back to the mountaintop and speak to your only equal, you know. Cause Ma because Marin is really fucking smart. And he was at one point uh placing himself above everybody else you know he just thought that there was nobody who was his equal except for god and he couldn't relate to other people because he was just so intellectually advanced and uh yeah that was that was his thing although you know we talk more about how he kind of got over that later he calls out the demon calls out to willie uh carl's wife and says i bring you good news elvira is alive spoiler alert she lives and she's a drug addict. Go visit her on Mother's Day, you know. By the way, Mother's Day's coming up. Uh, Willie's like, oh. And Carl's like, no, like, don't tell her. Like, Carl does not, Willie does not know Elvira's alive. I mean, Willie thinks that she died and Carl does not want her to know. He's been, like, covering this up. But I guess the cat's out of the bag now. Cat's out of the bag now. Um, but Karis moves to give her more Librium. Uh, you know, Sharon's going to help. Sharon gets vomited on. She leaves. Uh, Chris has to step in to try to help. The demon starts accosting Chris, you know, saying, you did this. Uh, you put your career before your daughter, your divorce. You know, you put your career before your husband. It caused this divorce. Reagan, you drove Reagan to this. Then she starts going after, the demon starts going after Karis. You know, we know of your kindness to mothers, you know. And, and then it starts singing this choir boy benediction. It's break time. End of round one. Ding, ding. We're done. We're done for the first round. Uh, time for Sharon. Sharon's just constantly... I feel bad for Sharon. I don't... I, honestly, I don't know. I kept thinking in my head, like, Willie, Carl, and Sharon not quitting. You know? Like, like how much are they being paid to do this? Like, because this is a lot. Like, this is a lot for people. I was like, damn, that's some really good help that you have, Chris McNeil. Because I don't see anyone putting up with this in this day and age who would be like all right well let me go change let me go change all this diarrhea demon diarrhea fucking diaper let's go change another one and every time she changes her i mean it's like pfft, immediately starts fucking diarrheaing all over the place again just vomit she's constantly sharon's constantly taking stinky loads of bedding and clothing and soiled diapers out of that room, you know? And I mean, I, that washing machine after this is all over, they should just burn it. They should just get rid of it. I can't imagine, you know? I mean, how could you ever want to put, I mean, once you put that shit in there, why, you can't use that for anything else. Um, it's crazy. But, uh, but yeah, so she's, she's cleaning her up. She's cleaning her up. Everybody outside, everybody outside. Let me change this diaper. Dipe. And Karen or Karis and Marin are talking and, uh, you know, Marin confides in him and says, I know that you doubt this. I know that you don't think this, they don't really believe in God or demons right now, whatever. But this demon I have met once before. OK, like you may think this is bullshit. I've met this guy. He's powerful. OK, so just like let me, like this is the deal. And Karis is like, well, what, I mean, what the fuck is the point of like, what is the point of possession? Like, I, I don't understand. Like, what, to what end? Because apparently, you know, if you are possessed, whatever you do, it's not you. So you, you know, the soul is like, you're not going to go to hell. You're like, the soul inside of the possessed person who does these evil deeds, like, it's not going to be damned because it's been possessed, you know? So what's the point? You know, if they're, if they're not damning the soul, what's the point of the possession? And uh, Marin says, who knows, but I think the demon's target is not the possessed but the observers to make us despair reject our humanity to see ourselves as bestial and vile without dignity perhaps the heart of it is a feeling of unworthiness for i think that the belief in god is not a matter of reason at all i think it finally is a matter of love of accepting the possibility that god could ever love us that's what i think it's about you know that's what i think it's about 
He says, long ago, I despaired of ever loving my neighbor. Certain people repelled me. How could I love them? It led me to despair of myself. And from that, despair of God. My faith was shattered. So, you know, here you have a man whose faith has been shattered, talking to a man whose faith was shattered, but has obviously figured it out and put it back together. Uh, and so, of course, Karis is like, well, then what happened? Like, how did you, how did you figure it out? Asking for a friend. Um, and he said, at last I realized that God would never ask of me, which I know to be psychologically impossible, that the love which he asked was in my will was not meant to be felt as an emotion. He was asking that I act with love, that I do unto others, that I should do it unto those who repelled me was a greater act of love than any other. How many husbands and wives must believe they have fallen out of love because their hearts no longer race at the sight of their beloveds? I tend to see possession most often in the little things, Damien, in the senseless, petty spites and misunderstandings, the cruel and cutting words that leap unbidden to the tongues between friends, lovers, husbands, and wives. Enough of these, and we have no need of Satan to manage our wars. These we manage for ourselves. And yet even from this, from evil, there will finally come good in some way, in some way that we may never understand or even see. Perhaps evil is the crucible of goodness. Perhaps Satan, in spite of himself, somehow serves to work out the will of God. Wow. I think that's really interesting. Um, I really liked that a lot because I've, I've thought about it. It's like, well, you know, when you look at the Kabbalah Sutri of life and at the very top, you have the monad, which is, which is everything, all energy, God, all combined into one, one, you know, dimension. I don't know, some unfathomable thing. And everything in this universe is, comes from that. You know, so like everything is a part of God. Everything is energy, you know. And so that would also apply to demons. That would also apply to like Lucifer, for example. You know, like these, that they would also be a reflection of God, a part of God. And so if everything is God, then even the serpent in the garden wasn't being malicious, you know. I mean, maybe it thought it was being malicious, but really, was it serving the will of God, you know? Like... I don't know. It's an interesting thing to think about. Um, and I mean, certainly in this case, I mean, you have Karis, who's lost his faith. And I mean, he's led back to his faith through this encounter with a demon. So, I mean, you know, maybe there's something to it. <laughs> uh, I like there's this there's this Alan Watts. Uh, Watts, I think it's in Watts Wave 3 where he's talking about people, you know, passing the blame down through the generations and we have to stop, you know, trying to explain the things we're doing now by the things that, that happened in the past and he says, you know, if we kept on this thing, we would, we would, you know, blame it all the way back to the Garden of Eden, you know, and Eve would, would say, oh, I didn't do it, it was the serpent who beguiled me. You know, and God would look at the serpent and say, you know, oh, what are you doing? And then the serpent uh, he probably winked, you know, it's just like, I'm playing this part, you know, like, I'm not going to blame it. I did this because this is a part of, this is the part that I was born to play in this great drama uh, that we have unfolding before us. So Karis also asks, what's to keep the demon from coming back in? And Maren's like, I don't know, but I've never seen it happen. So once it's out, it's out. You don't have to worry about it. Uh, Karis goes to ch check on a sleeping Reagan. And then, oh, man, Marin's not there. And then the, the demon's like, starts up with that. Why you do this? Why you do this to me, Demi? Why you do this to me, Demi? Uh, starts fucking with him, using his mom's voice, guilt tripping him like a motherfucker. Then the Dennings personality comes out and he's like, look, this is the only life I can lead. OK, this little bitch killed me and now I'm here and this is all I have. So, like, just leave me alone. Like, let me have this, dude. Like, can you just, like, fuck off? Uh, and then the demon starts talking to him and say, you know, this, she will die from Marin's pride and your incompetence. You should not have given her the Librium. And he feels her pulse and it's feeble. And he's like, oh no, I've given her too much. I've given her too much. The demon's right. Fuck, her heart rate is not great. And then the demon's like, hey, guess what? I'm not going to let her go to sleep. She's not going to go to sleep. 
she's gonna fucking die like her heart rate's so weak she has to get rest she's just gonna fucking die and i'm not gonna let her go to sleep and so um they call in a cardiac specialist and uh, the cardiac specialist essentially confirms it's like she's just got to sleep before her blood pressure drops dude and uh you know what the fuck is going on in there <laughs> you know like oh my god and what and then Kara's like what can I do and it's like pray like the doctor tells him pray like he doesn't have any answers for him so now we're on to round two we're staying up for like three days so we got without so that was Friday I believe uh there's no sleep that night and then no sleep Saturday or Saturday night Sunday we're still going you know this whole time like you know, Marin just, they keep doing the ritual over and over and over again. Uh, they keep repeating, repeating the ritual, praying for sleep. And now it's finally Sunday. It's Mother's Day. We end this whole shebang on Mother's Day. You get more guilt trips from, from dead mom. Uh, you know, and Damien's just, oh my God, he's on his, he's, he's, he's just not doing so great. So he's sent to go get some get some rest uh he's like just leave dude you need to go you need to go dude you need to go lay down he goes home but guess what there's no rest for the weary kenderman shows up just as damien was just trying to get some sleep dude just i feel so bad for him i just felt so bad that kenderman showed up you know and um hypothetically he lays out the case and uh he's like hypothetically i know that fucking reagan did this so hypothetically she's dangerous and she may do this again so the cop part of me feels like i should do something about this but hypothetically i could should i just forget this and, and just hope that she gets well uh I, I you know i don't know what to do here and karis uh, offers him i would put it in the hands of a higher authority so he's like drop it kinderman it's like, and uh, Kenderman's like, well, it looks like you guys are already working on it. So, uh, okay, you know, all right. And on his way out, uh, Kenderman tells Damien to tell Carl that Elvira is in a clinic and that she's all right. So Kenderman was able to put some pressure on Carl's daughter, catch her doing some fucking shady shit and then be like, hey, you can go to jail or you can go to a fucking clinic right now. And so she chose the clinic. So that's great. Uh, and then before he leaves, also, he said, can we see a movie? Can we please just see a movie, dude? And I need you to calm down. I need you to get some rest. And I just want to see a movie with you. And, uh, Karis, again, brushes him off soon. We'll do it. It was soon. Sure. You know. Uh, Kinderman's off. Karis goes back to McNeil's house. No sleep. Uh, Chris is reading an old Mother's Day card from Reagan. Uh, Karis reading this, this really cute, sweet little poem that this daughter wrote. Uh, he goes from compassion to rage to sorrow to frustration. And he's just like, I'm done. I, we got, I got to help this. Like, this is too much. Like, I'm fucking so pissed. He goes upstairs. He checks Reagan. He finds Marin dead on the fucking floor. Marin's dead. His heart gave out. He couldn't do it. He couldn't do it. He couldn't do it. And the demon is, you know, bummed. Like, the demon's like... I wasn't done with this motherfucker. Like, God damn it. Like, we're... She... Because, like, the demon wants Marin to see Reagan die. You know? Like, and it's like, no. Like, you're not supposed to die first. Like, that spoils the whole thing. Like, he's super, super bummed. Uh, and Karis is just, like, pissed. Like, he snaps. He just... He's like, he's done. He's so fucking pissed. He starts calling the demon a loser. You're good with, with children. You know, you're good with little girls. Well, come on, you know, like, come on, dude. Like, try try someone your own fucking size, okay? Let's see you try something bigger. Leave the girl and take me. Come into me, you know, and, uh, and it works. The demon makes the leap and jumps into Karis' body because Reagan's so wasted, you know? And, like, the thing is, like, when you hear earlier... The demon is afraid of going into the void. So it's like, well, if Reagan died and it's in that body, then, like, I assume that the demon would go into the void and, like, that isn't where it wants to go. So it wants to hang on. And so it makes the leap into Karis. Uh, at first, Karis tries to go, you know, it's like, oh, I'm going to go strangle Reagan. Like, you know, the demon wants to go finish the job and strangle Reagan. But uh, Karis is able to, to fight him back. He screams, no. And he leaps out the window to kill himself. 
just like the pigs that ran over the cliff in the Bible story. So we talked about, you know, when Jesus, uh, you know, exercised the demon out of that legion demon out of that man. And uh, they jumped into a herd of pigs and then the pigs threw themselves off a cliff into a lake and drowned. Uh, same thing, you know, <laughs> avoid the void. Yeah, you got to avoid the void. So he does the same thing. He, he jumps out the window. He, he falls down the stairs. Uh, Reagan is back. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Reagan's back. Elvira's in a clinic. I mean, you know, it's been a gnarly trip, but, you know, we have some light at the end of the rainbow. Mother's Day. Like, Chris gets the best gift she could ever fucking want. She, the best gift she could ever fucking want. And, uh... And same with Willie. I mean, not only did she find out her daughter is alive, but now she's although although Karis didn't ever didn't ever tell Carl that Elvira was in the clinic before he died. So I assume that Kinderman told him later. But I mean, I was kind of like a little bummed. But anyways, so Sharon uh, she goes to find Dyer at the residence hall. Uh, they call an ambulance. They go to Karis, who's at the bottom of the stairs. He's still alive. Dyer's holding his hand. He can't speak, you know, but he can squeeze. He takes his confession and he gives the last rites to Karis before uh, he dies. And he sees uh, when he dies, Karis's eyes are filled with peace, joy at the end of heart's longing. And Dyer goes uh, with the body in the ambulance. So, uh, so yeah, fucking Karis gave himself, you know, gave himself for a girl that to save a girl he never even knew. And, uh, you know, we can assume that he did find uh find his faith again in the very end of this book now for the epilogue the mcneils are preparing to get the fuck out of town they're gonna go move back to la they're getting out kinderman has closed the investigation of the deaths of father karis and Marin. Marin was obviously a heart attack karis that one was a little harder to explain and also he didn't he obviously didn't go after them for like the burke dennings thing either so Karis, uh, he comes to rationalize. Karis had snapped due to a lack of sleep over several days, the guilt over his mother, uh, her death, his problem of faith, his concern over Reagan's imminent death, the demonic attacks, the shock of Marin's death, uh, and Car and uh, Kinderman also, you know, read that exorcists sometimes become possessed when they feel guilt and the need to be punished. Uh, so he's like, well, I'm just going to say that he snapped and killed himself. So that's how we're going to, that's what we're going to write in this report. Uh, he flipped out. He was under a lot of stress and he just flipped out and killed himself. And uh, Reagan, she can't remember what the fuck, you know, they ask her what happened. She's like, I don't know what you're talking about. Father Dyer drops by before they leave. Uh, you know, Chris, again, like, she's like, you know, he never even knew her, you know, like, Karis never even knew Reagan. And Dyer asks, as a non-believer, do you think that she was, do you think that she was really possessed, you know? And honestly, I was kind of shocked that, like, Chris isn't a believer after all of this, honestly. I was like, wait, she's still on the fence? Bitch, like, you're still on the fence? And she says, uh, she's like, I don't know about God, but I, I can, I could buy the devil. I could believe in the devil. Uh, and then Dyer comes back and says, well, if all the evil in the world makes you think that there might be a devil, then how do you account for all the goodness in the world? And she's like, well, you got a point there, you know, like, uh, yeah. Um, she also can't believe that Karis had a problem with faith. You know, she's like, he has the strongest faith I've ever seen, you know, which is like a really nice thing to say. Um, but uh, Dyer also, you know, he recalls this fiercely shining glint in Karis's eyes before he died. You know, he sees this glint and is, he thinks, is, was that victory? Was it, was it triumph? You know, had Karis died overcoming his problem of faith? Did he find God once again? You know, uh, Dyer thinks that, that like, yeah, he did. You know, he found peace. He found God. He restored his faith. Uh, me being you know uh <laughs> me reading legion and knowing the rest of the story i'm like or was that a glint from the demon you know like or was that was that glint in the eye was that a fucking you know was that some demon glint i don't know you know well, well i don't want to spoil anything uh but you know there's there's a lot more that goes on and this story is continued in legion uh 
Chris and Re- Reagan leave for L.A. Kinderman shows up right after they leave. Kinderman and uh, Dyer finally meet. Father Dyer. And uh, obviously, you know, Kinderman's never going to get to see that movie with Karis. He's never going to get to have the bromance with Karis. They would have been a, a great pair. They would have been amazing friends. This demon possession cock blocked him, got in the way of his friendship. But now he meets he meets a new he meets a, he meets a new friend, Father Dyer. Uh, and he asks Father Dyer to go. This, this man is so hard up for just like, he just wants to go to a movie with a motherfucker. Like so bad. Like he just wants to go to a movie with a fucking dude so bad. And, uh, and so, uh, as they're walking away, you know, arm in arm, uh, this is the beginning of a, of a beautiful bromance, you know, like this is, he finally, Kinderman, this whole book, he's just been trying to watch a movie with motherfucker, and he finally finds a motherfucker to do that with, and uh, and I think that's that's great. <laughs> that's great. You have these two men, two men fucking connecting. The bromance is real. Uh, again, this bromance is uh, you you see it in in Legion. Uh, these two characters show back up in Legion. Hold, let me grab it for you. In this book. Uh, in this book, which is uh, a direct sequel to The Exorcist. So, uh, also, if you're watching The Exorcist movies, uh, Exorcist 3 is based off this book. So, if you're watching the movies, watch The Exorcist, and then watch Exorcist 3. You can skip Exorcist 2. You don't need to see that, okay? It's not based off anything that William Peter Blatty wrote. It was some total trash. It, the only thing that you need to watch of Exorcist 2 is the trailer. It has a magnificent trailer. The trailer is so fucking cool. Everything else sucks, okay? Everything else sucks. But in Legion, uh, this takes place, I don't know, maybe, uh, I don't know if it's 10, 20 years later. Uh, 10, 20 years later, we got Kinderman back on the case. There's some there's some demonic fucking weird murders going on that seem like there's some desecrations are starting again. There's some fucked up murders that are happening that are that are fitting the M.O. of a fucking serial killer who died a long time ago. You know, it's just like shit is not adding up. Uh, and Father Dyer is also in this. So those two men uh, play the, the main role in Legion. Uh, so this is, this is pretty great. So maybe we'll read this next year. You know, we're, we're done for this year. We're done with book clubs for this year. Thank you everyone who joined me. I mean, a lot of the people in our Twitch chat have been here through the 33 strategies of war. When we did war club, uh, when we did, uh, children of Dune club and for our third and final book club exorcist club. So give yourself a round of applause, everyone. Thank you for reading all these books with me in 2020. I really appreciate you guys coming out. It's been a real weird fucking year for a lot of us. A real weird fucking year. But I think that, you know, we've had a lot of fun here on Twitch, despite how fucking bizarre this year has turned out for so many of us. Uh, It's been kind of a weird, weird one. So uh, I'm happy to have been able to share uh, my time with you guys and give us all something to do while we're you know in various states of lockdown so (laughs) in various yeah three book clubs in a year not too shabby I know I know I'm I'm really I'm really excited to have done these with you guys this has been such a wonderful trip and uh, I think I thank everybody for participating and being a part of it and uh, we're not we're not gonna do any more book clubs this year 2020 we're done on our book clubs uh, but uh, you can look forward to you know, I'm thinking at least two book clubs next year. So I'm thinking God Emperor Dune Club in the spring. And then 2001, a book club in the fall or the winter. So that's my tentative book club plans for next year. Uh, I definitely want to do a lot more YouTube videos, start getting some more YouTube videos out for you guys and get back to the, get back to my, not my old format, but you know, where we're kind of doing some deep dives of some things. And we're also going to be streaming here on Twitch, doing some different stuff. I don't know what yet, but it's going to be fun. <laughs> we're just going to be hanging out. We'll do some tarot streams next week. Uh, maybe we'll do Mystic Monday. Maybe we'll do some Let's Plays. Maybe we'll do a painting stream. I don't know. You know, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just trying to kick it for the rest of the year because it's been a hard year for all of us, you know, and I'm tired. I think we're all fucking tired. So, uh, 
Yeah. So thank you everybody for joining me for Exorcist Club. We are going to take a break and then we're going to come back and just fucking kick it. We're just going to hang out. Uh, so yeah, uh, we will be right back. 19 Academy thanks these lovely people for all their generosity and support on patreon.com slash Danica XIX. And don't forget to subscribe to this channel, like this video, ring the bell, and tell your friends. You can join me live on twitch.tv slash Danica XIX and follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Danica XIX. Support for 19 Academy comes from viewers like you on patreon.com slash Danica XIX.